Oscar Bevis, IFL, TV, MTK Global. Delighted to be joined by Hitman, Ricky Hatton, in the Matra Bubble. How are we, mate? Yeah, I'm good. Looking forward to um, Saturday's fight night. Um, yeah, first one for a while, isn't it? So, uh, yes, yeah, good. Going to be good. Looking forward to it. Yeah, good to get back into the, uh, the swing of things and good to get back to the bubble as well. Obviously, I know you've done um, the one with Campbell um, when he announces the deal with Matram, but just like everyone chilling in there, playing pool, playing table tennis, I suppose it's the sort of environment that, I suppose, even though there's no fans and you thrived off that, you wouldn't have minded playing a bit of table tennis no, before <laughs> and all that. I've got a lot of friends in, in boxing, not only the, you know, the present fighters, you know, boxing managers and matchmakers and the, the security of, you know, Matram that I've known for... For years, so it's um, you know in, in, you, it's nice to be. And I mean, you know, you are in your room twenty four hours too. You have, you have your COVID test, but then when you come out of it, you've got a couple of days there where you can spend it with your boxing family, um, have a little bit of a game of pool, game of darts in there, and having a laugh. You know, with, with people that because of the lockdown you've not seen for ages. So yeah, it's uh, it's all good. Yeah. Ibrahim Nadim. Now I just asked you how we'd be making the weights. Obviously, uh, he's a tall lad, and you said so that's the first thing on the agenda today. Going to be spot on. Yeah, he's. Um, people always say that to me how big he, he looks for for the weight, and he uh, he carries it. Uh, he carries it really well. To be honest with you, he spars with people. You know, you know, lads. You know, up to like welterweights and and welters. And when you think he's a super bantamweight, and he holds himself well, he's uh, he's developing as he's come along, and he's got a, a step up in class against um, Johnny Johnny Phillips. Do you know what I mean? And um, but it's a step up in class. I think he's. Um, well capable of um, of taking. I think he's improving all the time. He's improved massively of lockdown because, I mean, we've all been in lockdown, but when we've uh, been able to open the gym for your professional athletes, like we've been able to do, he's, he's been on and working on things and putting things right. And I think uh, I think he's going to gonna shine. It is a step up in class for him, but one that I wouldn't have taken if I didn't think he was capable of doing it. Yeah. Well, obviously, it shows the confidence that you've got in Ibrahim. And that time away, Eddie spoke about it yesterday at a press conference. Is there also a bit of a danger that you can be out for too long and try and over-perfect things? Because he said to me yesterday, Prim, he said, I'm a better fighter because of how long I've been in the gym now. Now I've been perfecting my craft. But can you be doing it for too long or, or is that not a thing? No, I don't think it at all. I don't think, you know, the, the main thing is, you know, you, you may have been, no, maybe no fight dates coming up for, for a lot of the, the, the fighters out there. You feel sorry for a lot of the fighters that haven't got dates, but I mean... You know, if he kept in the gym, he kept working, he kept training, because don't forget, he's not preparing just for his next date, he's preparing for the next eight, nine, ten years. So he should be in the gym. And I said, listen, Ibi, I said, listen, if you if you keep in the gym, keep fit, keep improving, which is all it's all about, about, keep learning. I said, you never know if you're on the weights and you're round about and your fitness levels are, you know, whereabouts they should be, you never know. Hopefully, you know, you might get a phone call and uh, something might raise its head and a fight might come up. And that's exactly what did. He's only had like... Uh, two or three weeks notice of it but he because uh, he's been in the gym he kept himself in a position where he was to take he was able to take advantage of um, of the late call if it had been uh, like his trainer used to do sat having pork pies and pints of Guinness while uh, while in lockdown he wouldn't have been able to capitalise on this great opportunity so uh, yeah I'm very very proud of him um, a bit of a difference in personalities as well Johnny Mental Phillips as Eddie called him I remember the first bubble when he fought Hopi Price um and he was giving it to Dave Colwell all week. He was missing the weight, laughing, swearing, abusing. A bit more down to earth this week, it seems. But, um, yeah, like, not a clash of personalities, but two very different boxing personalities. He's very quiet and very reserved, in him. Yeah, well, I, I, I came into the bubble a day later. So my my my, um, my partner from the coaching team, Blaine Eunice, uh, brought Ibi down and he said at the press conference, he, had, he said he was very respectful and, and stuff like that. And um, But, you know, you have different... Opponents that Ibi has got to get used to, those that are quiet, those that are mouth, those will get in your face and, and stuff like that. But I wasn't too concerned, but because, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes worry whether he's so laid back, Ibi, so quiet, so laid back. I sometimes wonder if he's actually got a pulse. <laughs> you know, Ibi, are you with us? He's, <laughs> but he's just such a chilled, chilled character. And, um, if Johnny was ranting and raving and performing a little bit like that, he'd have been pissing into the wind, as they, they say with Ibby. And I think, uh, I think having Johnny having met Ibby, he probably sees where I'm coming from because he's a very quiet, very you know personal. But with that quietness, is a is an eerie confidence with him, you know, which is uh, which is uh, he's, he's going to need because I know Johnny will come and put him under pressure and make him work. And uh, it's all about Ibby after only two fights, you know, showing the. Uh, 
show him what he's all about. And if he gets a winner, which I think he will do against a good fighter, which Johnny Phillips is, you know, for in, you know, for someone to be only having his second fight to be in with Johnny, I think shows how highly I think of Vibby, and I'm sure he'll, he'll do the business. Yeah, we look forward to seeing him making that step up on, on Saturday night and opening opening the show and this run of fantastic shows that we've gotten more to be announced as well. So, all, all good well, stuff. He's got to take a chance like this, and he's not taking a, taking a chance. You mean like not sail through? He's got like if you're the first one to make a statement, you're opening the show. Yeah, why not? I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's like. Um, it's a fight I don't think many people would blame for me having in, you know, maybe having a couple more fights under his belt maybe before than going for for Johnny. But it's a, at the end of the day, you know, there's uh, there's lads out there, you know, that you know aren't getting fights, you know, the, you know, because of the COVID climate, you know, there's no there's not as many shows, not as many fights, uh, and I think if he you know impresses against in, in if he impresses like I know he will do in his step up, um, I'm hoping you know. It, there might be a bit more work coming from 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 Eddie. It's, this, it's an opportunity where Eddie's, Eddie's moving up in class after only two fights, fighting a dangerous opponent for only having two fights. But if he impresses, I think he might he might get a bit more more work, and that's that's the that's the reason. Campbell um, signed a deal with two five eight management. When you look at the roster of some of the guys they represent, and obviously headed and fronted by Andy Joshua, is it a no brainer really that, that Campbell? takes on that, that management team to guide him through his boxing career? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's got a great team behind him. He's got, you know, you know, me behind him as, you know, as his manager, my brother Matthew behind him as his trainer, Matchroom, Sky Sports, 258. You know what I mean? It's, he's like, he's got the best platform and the best team behind him now for, to do the business. But ultimately, it'll be down to him to, to do the job in the ring and impress and do that. And I, you know, I, I think he, uh, I think he will. And, um, I respect my, you know, I respect my son. You know what I mean? And he's got a lot to. Uh, he's going to go. He's going to go into the hardest game in the world in boxing. And with, you know, with with a dad like myself that did what I did. You know, he, just imagine um, how much pressure I guess he's, he's under in many respects. You know, but uh, it doesn't seem like he feels the pressure. Though. He, he, I mean, the interviews I've seen with him, he seems very unfazed by. It. No, he thrives on the pre pre the pressure. He thrives on the pressure, and that's the interesting thing. But I mean. Looking down at my at my son, it makes me so so proud when he knows what he's got to live up to. That he's giving it a go anyway because he didn't need to go into boxing. I fought so he didn't have to go in, but he, he is. He wants to do. He wants to give it a go. He's dedicated. He's determined. Uh, he'll get his own identity. You know what I mean? And where a few years, you know, won't be long before they're turning around and saying that's not Ricky Atten's son. They'll be saying that's Campbell Atten, and that's what we what we want. He's got a great platform and team behind him to to do it, and I think he's got. Um, half a chance. I don't think when he gets in the ring and has to prove himself by himself, I don't think he'll be found wanting. When you were younger and, and Campbell was a young, young boy, you must have had visions of like, oh, I'd love to be able to say my son's a world champion, even the first time I could take my son on the pads. And I can imagine, you know, Campbell's got kids of his own. I can imagine he thinks about that himself now. Did you ever think when you were fighting back, oh, I, I can't wait for the day? I know you said you fought so he didn't have to do it, but did it cross your mind? Like, I can't wait for the day that Campbell can no, not get in the ring or. Not one bit. No, I didn't. I didn't really want him fighting because I think most boxers will say, "Listen, we we fight to earn a living, so our kids don't have to to, to fight in in the ring in order to to earn a living." You know. So, but uh, at the end of the day, it's in his blood. It's in in the the genes, and it's like the minute you know, because his dad did a little bit of boxing. He's obviously you know watched the videos, and he's he's gone in the boxing gym. He's done a little bit himself, and it's like it's one of them. Very addictive sports boxing. It's like you know, you, you either like it or you don't. First time you get it on the nose, it's either thank you, but no thanks. Oh, ooh, you know, I like this. It's a very addictive sport. And um, the would you open for a no thanks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the minute he got, minute he, he got into it, you know, uh, and he, he was hooked. Then and then he got the buzz, you know. And at the end of the day, you've seen him, you know, he, he started off, uh, you know, you know, stop and start when he when he first kicked off. You know what I mean? And he. Uh, but I think in the last two years, you know, uh, he started working, um, you know, with myself and and Matthew. And I think the next two years, I think he's really last last two years, he's really slipped a gear. To be honest with you, I mean, he's, he was a little bit of a late bloomer, so you know, he lost a couple here and there uh, along the way. But I think the last two years, he's really, really slipped a gear. You know, what he's been doing in the gym with me and Matthew, and what he's been doing sparring with some of the people he's been sparring with. You know, when those then when he. When he did, you know, uh, want to go pro, I thought to, uh, uh, when, when he did reach a certain level and how he was performing, I feel confident in him now that uh, 
he's, he's, he's gone pro at the right time, if you get me meaning, yeah. Ricky, can I ask you about a situation that seems to have been, I don't know, appearing again and again and just popping up once more over the last, uh, over the last year or so? Deontay Wilder and Mark Breeland, you've been in the position of fighter in high-level world title fights. You've been in the position of trainer as well. Um, the back and forth that, you know, Mark Breeland has finally had his say and Deontay Wilder still sort of pipping at him as well. Um, can I just get your take on things up until now, especially the last couple of weeks? Well, it's not for me to, to call, you know, a, a former fellow because, I, you know, uh, Deontay is, you know, you know, great fighter, been a great champion, one of the biggest knockout artists in heavyweight boxing. When you look at knockout artists, he's probably up there with the best with, they've, ever, they've ever been as far as a knockout artist goes. So I have a lot of respect to him, but um, I just think, you know, you know, Question, you know, I mean, he was saying that, you know, with the, task, the Tyson Fury fight, I was putting metal plates in his glove, you know what I mean? The official signs of gloves in the changing rooms. You have a f official in between the rounds looking over <laughs> looking over the trainer's shoulder, making sure that everything's all right. I think, I, I, I think to myself, Deontay, is serious, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, at the time, you know, there was me in the corner, you know, uh, ben Davison's trained world champion. I've trained a world champion. Freddie Roach, God knows how many world champions. Hall of Fame boxing trainer. And, you know, to say that, you know, there was a little bit of underhandedness going on in the corner. And then when he, he had a pop at everyone in, a, in in our corner, then went to, to Mark Breland, who's a former world champion in, he, in his own right. I just, uh, I, I, don't, I think... I think the best way I can I'll put it, you know, it's not it's not for me to call a film a fellow professional or anything like that. And I'm I'm not doing like that. I'm just I just I was just bitterly disappointed in him. You know what I mean? To think that, you know, I I, I would never call a, a film a professional, let alone accuse some of the people in that corner of of what he did and, and people in his own corner, you know, that have uh, that have um, done what they've done in the sport. You know, to point the finger at people like that, I think it's, it shows a little bit a bit of lack of class. Do you think it'll be a tough ring return if he is to make his return? I mean, there's so many fights that are touted to be good fights for Deontay. And like you said, because of his I knockout artist power. I just, a, I just hope he's in a good place mentally. Because it's not rational. It's not, he's not making rational statements there. You know, against some of the people that... He, he, he said that That's not coming from a... I don't think a normal frame of mind, to be honest with you. And I just hope he's... Uh, I just hope Deontay, you know, it must have been a very hard bit of pill for him to swallow, you know, in, in the manner in which he lost in the last fight. So I just I just hope he's 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 okay in himself up there. Because I think with the, with the comments he's making, I think he, he might not be, you know. Canelo and Billy Joe Saunders, um we expect that it's gonna happen. Look, Canelo's a massive favourite against Avni or Jim. Um you can never write anything off in boxing but um yeah, because of the hat and history with Mr. Canelo, is that something that you're taking a big interest in? Is something that you thought about as well? Well, no, I mean, Matthew went the distance with Canelo. And when you see the fight two years today, that was a great performance by uh, by uh, our Matt. But, um, yeah, I mean, since that fight, when you see how he's come on and developed, you know what I mean? He, you know, he's, he's probably the best pound for pound. Or certainly, he's there anyway, and he's one of the best pound for pound fighters in the, um, you know, in the world. Great to watch, wonderful defensive uh, uh, fighter and some of the names on his record who he's, who he's beat, you know, you got to take your hat off to him. But I think um, as the fights are ticking down, he's had them tough fights with Golovkin. I mean, I think he had, he knocked out Kovalev, but I think, you know, I think Kovalev had his nose in front, you know, there in, in, in that fight. And when, with, as time goes on, making way and fighting the quality of opposition he's been in against, you know, sooner or later, there's got to be a dip in performance. And I think if he if he does have that dip in performance, the last dip in performance you want to have it in is a southpaw speed merchant with very few miles on the clock like Billy Joe Saunders. Do you know what I mean? Styles make fights and the timing of which fights are made sometimes makes a difference. This might be a good timing for Billy Joe, yeah? Was Billy Joe, I mean, he was a lot of people's front runner um, to be the man from the UK if we are going to have a man uh, to challenge Canelo the most, to, to be the man who could beat Canelo. Was that how you viewed it even in previous years? Because Billy has been pining for this fight for a good couple of years now. He has, and I don't think it's this, well, it's not just this fight. I mean, he's been like, you know, a, he's a two-weight WBO um, champion of, of, the, of the world, which is a fantastic uh, achievement. But, you know, seeing him in and around my gym in Manchester and seeing how he performs and seeing what he's capable of, even though he's a two-weight world 
WBO champion. He's, he's for me, he's worth more than that. He's, he's even better than he's even better than that. And you know, for someone of Billy Joe's to, to lose out on fights with the likes of Canelo and Golovkin, you know, just to name to name name a couple, I think would be heartbreaking. You know, he's became a two weight world champion, but he wants that big defining money money fight, that big defining that big name, don't he? You know, just to, you know to to, you know, to to cap it all off for me and. Um, for whatever reason, you know, it's 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 been stuttering and starting and stuttering, stuttering and starting his career, isn't it? You know, but I think, uh, you know, as he's I've got to know him over the years very well and in training in my gym, and we like to think we've become, you know, we're not on speed dial, but you like to think he's my mate. For me and being a boxing man, I would I'd hate to see him. You know, he retires now. He's had a wonderful career, but I'd, 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 it'd, be, it'd be a crying shame for someone with that ability to miss out on one of them big name fights, isn't it? Yeah. And just finally, before I let you go, because boxers do have to weigh in, which is a little bit important. Um, Dillian White, Alexander Povetkin, the rematch is in three weeks' time, possibly four weeks' time, three weeks, four weeks' time. Um, Povetkin obviously had COVID. We know what that does to the body. I don't know if there's too much we can take from it, but Dillian's having the camp in Portugal and he's on the red zone and it's all a bit messy. Um, do you see Dillian getting revenge? I think so. To be honest, I thought Dillian was... I mean, he, he's always in great wars, isn't he? But, I, you know, I think he was boxing a very... Um, Sensible fight against Povetkin last time. You know, he he was in front, he was banking him, banking the rounds. He was showing, um, rather than just getting stuck in, he was showing good boxing ability. He was picking him off, and then obviously your heart sank when he got when he when he walked onto that left left uppercut, which was uh, which was terrible. But uh, no, I think there's um, I think I don't think there's nothing to worry about the COVID, and I think that, you know anything like that. I think. Um, at the end of the day, the, there's so much at, on, so much at stake for both the the fighters like this. And I think if any of them had the slightest bit of illness or the slightest little bit where this camp's not gone bad, I think they should pull out. And I think they'd be right to to to, to pull out, isn't it? And I think they're experienced enough, you know, the Povetkin camp and Dillian White camp to know this. And we can't, you know, this is a major major fight. The winner of this goes on to for the for the world title. So you know. If there's anything, any slight little bit of um, either illness or, 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 or doubt through the preparation, you know, from that area, from the COVID area and all that um, stuff, I think the I think they experience enough camps to to pull out the fight because you know that you can't can't take a chance because it might be your last chance for both of them. I said uh, one more thing, but sorry, I do just want to add this. Obviously, Josh Warrington, uh, front to be. I'm not going to ask you about Josh, but more specifically, the belts. He's had to drop the IBF. I'm just wondering what you thought. Obviously, there's been more and more belts than since the days you were fighting. Um, do you feel like the governing bodies perhaps are slipping down in importance in, in the mind of fighters? I'm just wondering how, how you would take that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult one. I mean, you know, um, Josh, you know, had, had reached a point in his career where, you know, um, I think he, he beat Selby, he was an underdog. Then he had a good first defence against um, Frampton. And then um, and then he's had Kid Galahad, who's a world-class world class fighter, really good good fighter. And then he had the mandatory against, was it a French kid? I think he, he, he stopped, you know, so he's... He's won the title, you know, he's made a few defences, he's put a few quid in the bank, but I mean, Josh has reached a position now where he wants to probably better himself, you know what I mean? He wants to fight the, the unification fights or move up in weight or stuff like that or take all them wonderful Leeds fans over to America like the like the, the fans came over in front of me. That's where, and I just think sometimes with, with the Kid Galahad fight where I think the pain... The pain probably wasn't worth the gain. I mean, he's, he'd be going over old ground. Really, you know, what a fight a kid Gallagher has seen him, seen him, you know, actually in the gym. You know what I mean? And you know, he really is. And um, so, you know, I, I don't blame. You know, I, I, I know what's in Josh Warrington's mind. You know, he wants unification matches and big, big fights. You know, which it's uh, it's a shame because it would have been a good old British class. But that's the way it is. And to be honest, I, I um, when I fought Jose Luis Castillo. Um, I I um I was getting more money for the Castillo fight, so I went for Castillo. But the mandatory was a fella called Ben Rabar, and I think the Ben Rabar team were pushing for me to fight the number one contender. And uh, you know, by the end of the day, you know, yeah, you want to defend your title against the you know the number one contender. But you know, if there's a if there's a better fight out there, which Jose Luis Castillo was, you know, a real fighting legend, pound for pounder, you that's that's the route you've got to go. And I think Josh is doing very similar. You know what I mean? Do you feel like he's the closest thing we've seen, perhaps, uh, to yourself when it comes to that? 
fan base supporters. You mentioned taking them Leeds fans over to America like, like you've done as well. I suppose is Josh the closest thing since Ricky Hatton in that sense? Yeah, I think I see a lot of Josh in me. I mean, one is uh, he does his people people proud. And as, as the person, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, like the whole the whole camp, the whole the whole Warrington team. You know what I mean? You know, what you see is, is what you get. You know, he's uh, he's proud of his roots. He's proud of his hometown. You know, he what you know he's, he's just he's a good kid. He's down to earth. He's got an exciting style. Do you know what I mean? His crowd pleasing style, crowd pleasing personality. You know, I, I see myself in in so many so many ways. And you know, uh, yeah, I think he's he's won the world titles made some tough defensive and rightly so. Now I think he owes it to himself and the people of Leeds, you know, that, that support him to go out there and get the bigger names. I'm not saying, you know, Kid Galahad wasn't a bigger name because I tell you, I can't speak any more highly of that man from a talent perspective. But, you know, like I, you know, like he was, you know, mandatory for, for, for Josh. Like Ben Rabar was mandatory for me. I went for go for Castillo. And I think he wants, that's what Josh wants to do, similar. You know, I have a fight unification or a, a big name, and I think, um, to be fair, Josh has earned the right to try and pick that. I think. 